Let's turn to a different target. Um, EGFR exon 20 insertions are a, a different type of EGFR mutation. And we can take a step back and remind folks that EGFR mutations are not some one size fits all approach. We are getting more and more nuanced about this. And one subgroup is exon 20 insertions. Uh, we do have a couple of FDA approved somewhat active agents for this. Uh, one is a pill called Mobocertinib. One is a, an infusion called Amavantamab. But they both have uh, limited utility because their response rates, the tumor shrinkage rates are in the range of 20s, uh, capping out at 30%, and they have their own challenging side effects with them. Uh, I think that we would generally be inclined to favor using them, maybe not as the first line treatment, but at some point. But I would say there's still room to hope to do better. And here we have a, a new agent called Sunvazertinib. It also has its uh, name DZD9008. I don't think it has a marketed name at this point, but it's an oral inhibitor of EGFR XN20. So a pill-based therapy. This is uh, an Asian trial uh, that, uh, that enrolled 97 patients with an exon 20 mutation. These were pretty heavily treated patients, median of two prior therapies. And uh, this is called a waterfall plot. And on this type of plot, the bars going down from the line in the middle represent the tumor shrinking and how far they go down represents how much the shrinkage is. So the more you have uh, the lines uh, toward the right going down and the more of them that are going down, the better the drug is doing. And in contrast, the ones on the left that are going up represent the tumor growing despite treatment. So relatively few, in fact, very few patients with, uh, with the tumor increasing uh, despite this treatment. The response rate uh, with this medication in this heavily pretreated patient population was 60%. Um, there were uh, nearly half the patients had, uh, or a subset of patients had brain metastases. They seem to respond, but it's hard to know how much they were responding to this versus other local therapies they've gotten like radiation. It's, and that wasn't well teased apart. Another thing that we need to look at is the tolerability. And uh, here, diarrhea, uh, rash are some of the biggest ones that you'd feel. There's uh, certainly some blood tests that we might measure and see elevated. But, but in terms of the things that people are most likely to note and be bothered by, uh, diarrhea and rash are the most common here. They're the most common for this class of drugs. And, uh, you know, the investigators noted that the majority, the vast majority of these are grade one and two. So not in the serious range, but I think many of us would recognize that when we're talking about patients who have, uh, who are taking this for many, many months or ideally a year or more of treatment, as many of these target, these targeted therapies are hoped for, it, it matters whether you're experiencing even grade two diarrhea for months and months or a year or longer. And, and the novelty wears off. It's a, it's a challenge. And the, the grading system of what is bothersome or serious may be different when you're talking about chemo that you're planning to give for two or three months versus a pill-based treatment you're hoping to give for years. I, uh, this is not commercially available. It's, it's going to be studied further, but uh, the question is really what, what do you uh, see, uh, how encouraged are you by this and how much do you see this as a, a real need? Uh, Christine, can I start with you here? Of course, we do have other agents for this target, but does this seem to be an incremental benefit? Yeah. I mean, thanks, Jack. Uh, I, I, I think this is an exciting study. I think that when you put this in the context, so uh, let me take a step back and say, X120 EGFR mutations are the third most common EGFR mutations after X19 deletions and LA5AR. So they're um, a not trivial subgroup. And, and the, our treatment 
strategies are, are nuanced because not all mutations are the same. Um, and this is a great example of that. And you know, the drug we talked about before, osimertinib, for example, is not one that we can just give to patients with EGFR X120 insertions. So we need to take a more nuanced approach. Um, you know, if we think about, and this is a what I'm going to do is called a cross trial comparison. You're not supposed to do that. But the <laughs> other and the other agents that we have for EGFR for patients with EGFR X120 insertions in their tumor. Quite honestly, I, I don't love them, um, and, and I say that um, they're they're good options because they are options for EGFR on twenty insertion specifically, but they have they come at the cost of quite high toxicity and and the um, in terms of diarrhea and rash and and one of the drugs a drug called amivantamab comes also at, at, with a, a quite a significant rate of edema, um, and so um, I think this is an advance. Um, both because uh, the, the efficacy or, or, or the effectiveness against the tumor w was was very good, um, but also because I think this does look like it's probably more tolerable than than the drugs that we have um, currently available for patients with EGFR exon 20 insertion. So I'm enthusiastic for this for this compound to keep moving forward. Um, I think you know the toxicity that we see or the side effects that we see are are, are um, expected. Um, I acknowledge that, you know, like Jack said, you know, grade one diarrhea over time, not ideal. Um, but I think this, to me, again, you know, all the cross trial comparisons looks like it's better than what we have available right now. And, and I would even say, you know, we have had beaten into us that cross trial comparisons are, you know, are not ideal, not appropriate. On the other hand, that's what we have to do when we have, we, we don't have direct head to head trials. We yeah. have to, and we never will. And we, we just have to draw conclusions. We've got results of one trial. We have results from another and we have to move forward with something. Yeah. It has to be based on a cross trial comparison. That's really what it is. Even if it's not statistically pure, well, sometimes you can't always get what you want. So, um, Alfredo, what are, what was your take? How encouraged are you by these data compared to what's already out there? Yeah, I, I think very encouraged. Um, I think the data look really good. Um, bear in mind, again, uh, if we take some step back, uh, you know, uh, we thought that we didn't, you know, we didn't have anything to, to target this specific mutation. Now we have two drugs approved, a third one potentially interesting. Uh, with good response. Unfortunately, there's always going to be some toxicity. I don't want to minimize that or undermine this. It's, it's of course, a concern and, and it's something that we need to be aware of. But I think the data look really good. And uh, we're never going to have, as you all said, of course, had to add, uh, you know, a comparison. It's impossible. Um, but I was very impressed um, by by the data and uh, to have uh, something like that. So I'm really looking forward to, to you know, having more data. But it, it is really, really exciting. I would certainly welcome being able to offer this to, to my patients. Yeah, me too. I, think, yeah. me too. I mean, my, much better than the other, I, to my, not to throw any agent under the bus, but I think in terms of the toxicity, yes. Yeah, and the oral formulation, yeah, compared to Ami. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not just that it's the toxicity tolerability issues, but you're talking yeah. about a response rate, even if it falls short yes. of 60%, you're, you're in the range of twice what we saw at the yes. end. Yes, that's, that's, totally. yes, that's very impressive. Very yeah. impressive. So, 